Baptist Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? That's part of our name, Adventist. We believe in the second advent of, of Jesus Christ, and he is indeed coming. But before he comes, there is a word of Scripture that has touched me this week like I haven't been touched before, and it's, it's from the book of Jude. You may want to open up to Jude as we're going to be looking at that this morning uh, overall through this, this sermon time. And we'll be talking about where Jude came from and who he is and how he got to have this, this special little tiny book. And it is a special book. There's only one chapter in Jude. So you can say it was found in Jude 1, verse whatever, or you can just say it was found in verse 6 because there's only one chapter. But Jude says something that was part of our scripture reading this morning. And his admonition to us as a church living in the 21st century, even as to the first church in the first century that he was writing to, were these incredible words. Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Contend, hold on to that faith which was given you. And we're going to be looking in a few moments this morning what that faith is, what that word is, what that is that we must contend with, that which, which we must hold on to, and all the more as we look forward to the day of the coming of Jesus in the clouds of glory. The, the epistle of Jude. Who in the world is this Jude guy? 25 verses, one chapter, short little book, who in the world is Jude. Notice here, Jude gives an introduction himself. Jude 1, chapter 1, verse 1, the only chapter. Jude says, Jude, a servant of who? Jesus Christ. And a brother of who? James. This Jude is a servant, first and foremost, of Jesus Christ. And he's also a brother of James. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in all abundance. Now, Jude gives us an illusion as to who he is. He's, he's a servant of Jesus and he's a, a brother of James. Who's James? Well, if you go back a few pages in your New Testament, you'll find a book called James. And this is the James that we believe that Jude is referring to. We also look in the book of Acts and we discover there's a James who's the head of the church in Jerusalem. And it's obviously not James, the disciple that was close to Jesus, Peter, James, and John, because that disciple James, early on in the book of Acts, is executed by King Herod. So this is another James. Could it be James the Less? Most likely not from what Bible students have discovered. It's not that James, but we discover another James in the scriptures. And we also discover another Jude or Judas or Judah in the scriptures. This James, we believe, the, uh, that, that Jude is referring to is someone who was also not only the head of the Jerusalem church, but he's a brother to the Lord Jesus. You see, what do you mean a brother? Did Jesus have brothers? Did he have sisters? Well, the scriptures are pretty clear that he indeed did have brothers and of course, he had a mother and he had a father. Uh, the four brothers of Jesus are mentioned in the scriptures. They're found in, in, in some of the gospel references. And, and their names are this, as it says in the King James, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon. These are the four brothers of Jesus. Now, Joseph is a Greek version of Joseph. Now, it would make sense that he would have a brother named Joseph because his earthly father's name was what? Joseph. So here's Joseph Jr. James, Joseph, Judah and Simon, his brothers. Now, who are these brothers? Um, tradition teaches that Joseph had been married before, and then he married Mary, and he had come to that marriage with children of his own, perhaps these four sons, maybe a few daughters as well. The indication is that somehow Mary, after giving birth to Jesus, remained a virgin forever and had no more children. Now, that's tradition. There's nothing in the scriptures that allude that Mary didn't have any other children, or that she re remained a virgin forever. That comes out of another theology that we won't go into this morning. But these brothers either could have been Joseph's 
sons from another marriage, or they could have indeed been his sons through Mary. Or maybe some of them were his sons through Mary. In either case, they are either step or half-brothers to the Lord Jesus. And I say half because the father of Jesus is who? The father. His mother was Mary. And these children would have been maybe the children of Joseph and Mary, half-brothers to Jesus in that sense. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have grown up with your brother Jesus and have heard the stories that your mother would tell about how he came to be? <laughs> yeah, right, Mom. <laughs> yeah. What, what are you joking? He was, you, yeah, right. Dad isn't his, yeah, <laughs> we know how it works. And the jokes that must have gone on, because you see, his brothers did not believe in him, as we read in John chapter 7. We find in the Gospels of uh, Mark and, and Matthew an account where Jesus was speaking, and, and they came to him and they said, Lord, your, your, your mother and your brothers are here with you. And you remember what he said, who are my mother and my brothers? Those who believe in me are my brothers. You are my brothers. And then he went on to say, whoever cannot leave his mother, his brothers, and his sisters can have no part in me which gives some indication that perhaps Jesus had sisters as well. Unknown as far as name, because that was a common thing. But four brothers we know by name, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon. And they did not believe in him. Now again, I want to go back to the, th to the thought, what would it be like to grow up with somebody who you had heard was the son of God? <laughs> He'd be laughing, chiding him. And they did. They picked on him. They laughed at him. They, they teased him. They, they, they mocked him. They did not believe in him. But something must have changed because James became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And this Judah, this Jude, this Judas, and not Judas Iscariot, this third brother of Jesus writes this tiny little epistle but in this epistle is a message that is so profound for those of us living even today in the 21st century as we await and prepare for the coming of his brother Jesus Christ of Nazareth can you say amen to that this is a letter from I believe and other students of the Bible believe is a letter from the brother of Jesus you can't get much closer than that, can you? He knew what it was like to grow up with Jesus or Yeshua. He knew what it was like to sit at the breakfast table with him. He knew what it was like to take out the trash with him. He knew what it was like to, to know this man. You know, it's interesting, James and Jude are mentioned in the scriptures as writing, well, they've written these, these epistles. Joseph and Simon, we see no record of them past the story of their name. At the time of the cross, they did not believe in him. Who stood with Mary at the cross? None of them, but it was the disciple John. Who received the blessing of taking care of the mother of Jesus after his, his resurrection? John. Obviously, these brothers were not believers until after the cross. And after the resurrection, and wouldn't you believe after the resurrection? Well, I sure would. They weren't mentioned at the cross. They weren't there. They were hiding with the others that were, were in the bushes. But believe me, once he was buried, and when they knew he was dead, and when he came back to life, believe me, he had showed himself to them, and they became believers. Hallelujah. Amen? Notice these words of Jude, brother of Jesus. He had seen his brother in his life. He had seen the baptism. He had seen him speak in the synagogue and, and say that he was who he was, the, the Messiah of prophecy. He had seen Jesus call disciples to follow him. He had seen Jesus touch the children and heal the sick and raise the dead. And he had seen Jesus put on trial and put before a mob. And he had seen his brother Jesus hanging on a cross, that horrible, horrible cross. And he had seen that. And yet he could write of his brother incredible words. Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. What was the faith 
he said we should contend for, it was his faith in his brother Jesus. Notice here now, we'll start again with verse 3. Take your Bibles and open them up. Jude, verse 3. The only chapter in Jude. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, the salvation what? We share. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Obviously, there was a crisis going on in the church. Jude wants to write of the faith that we contend for, that we all believe together. But I want to tell you guys, there's some guys who've slipped into the church who don't believe that faith, and they're going a different direction. Verse 4, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Now, why doesn't Jude bring up the fact that he's the brother of Jesus? Well, would you, in trying to write, I mean, you're like, my brother Jesus, by the way, if you don't get rid of it, he's going to get you. No, I mean, that would be like, you know, you just want to get it low key. I had a friend in college who was a great grandson of Ellen White. His parents were the curators at Elmshaven there in St. Helena. And Tim, a good friend of mine, in fact, he was in my wedding when we were married many years ago. I, I asked him one time we were there in school, I said, Tim, so you're really Ellen White's great-grandson? Yeah, I don't want to talk about it, though. <laughs> I said, well, do you believe that she was a messenger of the Lord? Yeah, I do believe that, but I just, I would rather not focus on the fact that I'm her great-grandson. I said, why not? That's pretty cool. No, because everybody would try to measure me up to her in her words. I just don't want to have that burden. You can imagine what it would be like to be related to somebody famous like that. I mean, Jude here is a, is a celebrity, all right? But he keeps it low. And he refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as our sovereign and Lord. I mean, he is recognizing that his brother is God Almighty. That must have been converting. Verse 5, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt but later destroyed those who did not believe. You see, there were with the, uh, the Israelites, there were those who were pure Israelites who believed in the God of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and who were obedient to his word and, and who, who promised there at Sinai that they would obey, but there were also within that group uh, a mixed multitude of, of, of Egyptians of different races who had joined the, the, the Israelites. And there were others who were Israelites who didn't quite believe and so even though God delivered them all and brought them all to the Red Sea, not all of them stayed faithful, did they? In fact, Paul refers to the Red Sea experience as like a baptism. And just because you're baptized, just because you came into this faith, does that guarantee you that you cannot fall? Does it? No. We all still have a choice to make and that choice comes every single day. Excuse me. <coughs> so though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. So let's not go back to that old condition we were in. Verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their own home... These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In other words, angels turned their backs on him. Don't do this, folks. Don't turn your backs on him. As you read through Jude, you find very similar statements in the books of First and Second Peter as well. <coughs> These men were contemporaries, contending for the very same faith. Amen? Verse 7, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to immorality and perversion. They serve it as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, Judas telling the church here, listen, contend for the faith. Don't go backwards like the Israelites who came across the Red Sea. Don't lose your footing. And don't live like these 
slippery guys who slept, snuck into the church teaching immorality and all kinds of perverse things because remember the people there in Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened to them because of their perversion? They were destroyed by something called what? Eternal fire. In the very same way these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority and slander celestial beings. Wow. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak ab 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 abusively against whatever they do not understand and what things they do not understand by instinct. Like unreasoning animals, they, these are the very things that destroy them. They slander celestial beings. They don't even remember that Michael would not, would not, would not re, you know, fight with the devil except by saying, the Lord rebuke you. Now that whole story about Michael and contending over the body of Moses, that's a whole different story that we're going to have to look at in a different sermon, all right? If you'll, you'll wait for next week, we'll talk about that in greater detail because that would take up a whole sermon. Who was this Michael? What's he contending over the body of Moses over? What, what's going on here, all right? We'll come back to that next week. But these guys who have slipped into the church... They're teaching moral immorality, a license for immorality. They're denying that Jesus is the sovereign God. They're, they're, they're denying the faith. They're, they're slandering celestial beings. They're, they're saying anything goes. You can do whatever you want in the church and still be saved. It sounds like a once saved, always saved kind of doctrine, doesn't it? Judah's saying, though, contend for the faith. Be the faithful. Verse 11, woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. Was Cain a son of Adam? Was he? Yes, was he a son of God in a sense? Yes, did that guarantee him a place? Because he didn't what? Obey. He brought his own sacrifice. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's heir. They've been destroyed by Korah's rebellion. Was Balaam a prophet of God? Yes. Did he stay faithful? No. Was Korah part of the, the group that came through the Red Sea? Yes. Will Korah be in the kingdom? No, he rebelled. He's given these examples to, to warn us of rebellion and turning away. Verse 12, these men are blemishes at your love feasts, your agape dinners, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit. And uprooted, twice dead. Boy, he's really descriptive, isn't he? They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom blackness, the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. What? You know, is, he, is he quite pointed that these guys are uh, out of line with God? And yet they have slipped into the church and they claim the name of Christ. Not all who claim the name of Jesus are necessarily his followers, are they? Verse 14, Enoch Enoch, the seventh from Adam. The who? Seventh from Adam. This is the patriarch Enoch. Prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. What event is he speaking of? The coming of Jesus. To judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the un ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words Ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are, now get this, I mean, they're not just immoral, but they're grumblers. They're fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Now, friends, you may be saying, I'm not immoral. I don't do those kinds of despicable things. But what kinds of things do we fill our minds with? What kinds of television programs do we watch? Why should those who've been justified and sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ watch acts of immorality on television and live vicariously through those actors? Why should we? Amen? For when we see these things and when we watch them and we chew down our popcorn as they're taking place on the screen in front of us, we are in a sense acting out those scenes in our own lustful desires. Run from it, friends. Amen? Amen? Contend for the faith. Are there grumblers in the church? Are there fault finders in the church? 
Pull away from it, he says. Contend for the faith. <clears throat> but dear friends, remember, now let me back up. You see, if you believe a lie long enough, or say a lie long enough, will you actually begin to believe it? Will you? Yes. <coughs> Can we be turned away from a faith by our own playing with doubt? Absolutely. Let me share with you something that took place with me this last week that caught me off guard. I was, it was Wednesday. I'd come in to, for prayer meeting, kind of gotten out of bed somehow, crawled out to come to prayer meeting. I was eating a sandwich in the parking lot and listening to the radio at the same time. And um, I tuned in to the satellite radio to, to uh, CNN and there was an interview taking place. It was the uh, Michael, not the Michael, it was, um, who was the guy that inter interviews people on CNN? Oh, he's got that really gravelly voice, come on. Larry King. It was the Larry King show, and he was off the show, but he had a, a guest on there taking his place, and it's Dr. Sanya Gupta from CNN, who was nominated, by the way, as the Surgeon General, but he turned it down. And on this program, Sanya Gupta was interviewing former President Bill Clinton. And they were talking about health care, and they were talking about stem cell research because President Obama had just reversed the stem cell restriction from the federal government funding it. And they were talking about stem, stem cells and, and the embryos that come from, that, that create these stem cells. And Dr. Gupta, as he was interviewing former President Clinton, I caught this on the radio, and I couldn't believe that I really heard it, so I went home and I checked on the internet and I found the script and indeed he'd said these things and it caught me off guard because notice the science of what he said. Mr. Clinton said, it is obvious that we're not taking embryos that can, that under any conceivable scenario would be used for the process that would allow them to be fertilized and become little babies. I thought, hold it, what is an embryo? Go back to your biology in ninth grade, what is an embryo? It's a fertilized egg that's becoming what? A baby. I thought, well, maybe he slipped. Maybe he just made a mistake there. Maybe he just, you know. So he goes on in some of his other quotations. And I think it's obvious that we're not talking about some science fiction cloning of human beings. Then I think the American people will s support this. Okay. And then he went on to say this. I believe the American people believe it's a pro-life decision to use an embryo that's frozen and never going to be fertilized for embryonic stem cell research. And I thought, well, maybe I didn't understand what an embryo was. Maybe they're not fertilized. I began to doubt myself and doubt ninth grade biology. He went on to say this, there are a large number of embryos that we know are never going to be fertilized, where the people who are in control of them have made that clear. Well, here he's talking to a doctor who seems to know things. Well, maybe, maybe Bill Clinton's right. Maybe the doctor is, isn't objecting because I don't know what an embryo is. And he goes on now. And that is one of the things that I think these committees need to make it clear that they are not going to fool around with embryos where there's any possibility, even if it's somewhat remote, that they could be fertilized and become human beings. I thought, well, I guess I didn't know what an embryo was. So I went home and I got out my dictionary to see what an embryo was. And guess who was right? I was right. Dr. Gupta is obviously a very intelligent man. He's a, he's a medical doctor. What in the world would these guys... Or was there an agenda here to reshape the mind? My mind was already questioning and being reshaped. Hallelujah, I got on another website and discovered that several other people, many other people discovered this fault and they were all saying, hold it, doesn't he know biology? But friends, we can quickly be reshaped because of who's speaking to us and if they twist the truth, we can go along with it because of influence, can we not? These men who'd crept into the church at the time of Jude are speaking lies about God and Judas saying, please contend for the faith, that faith in him who was our Savior, who came to, to be our Savior from sin. My friends, the church then and the church now is living at a crucial time in history. 
and we must contend for this faith, and we must be careful not to turn away into, into theories that are man-made and theories that are destructive to our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. These are not times to be playing with fire. Notice verse 17 as we read on here in Jude, his letter. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers. Peter also said this in his epistle. Who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you. Who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupt flesh. And I love the closing words of Jude. As he says, to him who was able to keep you what? From falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. He can keep us from what? Falling. To the only God, our Savior be glory and majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Say it with me. Amen. Who was able to keep us from falling? The Lord Jesus, the brother of Jude, our Savior, our God. And next week when we look at that part of the passage where Michael the archangel contended with the devil over the body of Moses, you are going to be encouraged to know that this brother Jesus is someone who I want to hold on to. How about you? You see, he, the brother of Jude, is God Almighty. He is incredible. He is indeed the Lord of righteousness and the Lord of our salvation.